It's too bad. Hummingbird just came by. Welcome everybody to day 11 of our physical distancing broadcasts. Um, it's a special day. We have a little break in the weather. Last night uh, we got woken up by a couple of barred owls caterwauling to one another. And then Kim couldn't fall asleep. But unfortunately after that, it's a beautiful um, hummingbird. Turn your camera around just to show. Oh, nope, it's gone. Forget it. Uh, they move fast. Anyways, um, I just wanted to show everybody um, that, you know, I tried to cut, carry fire all night long, and it went really well until I went to sleep. I really stuffed it with more cattail, and then it kind of snuffed out. But you can see that it really burnt pretty well. We'll try it again some other time. But no fire tonight, because that was how we were going to start the fire. <laughs> but today is about burning, you know, because we were inspired last night, and then Kim went on a walk with Lily this morning, and... Uh, very thrushes we're calling in our trees, just or singing their beautiful three tone whistle. Yes, and if it's a, I have to tell people oh, yeah, how to tell if it's a very thrush. So, the way to tell if it's a very thrush is if you hear something that sounds like a referee whistle, yep. this time of year they hang out with the robins a lot, uh, yeah. feeding on the grounds, and they look a bit like a robin, only more dressed up for dinner. Dressed up for dinner, yeah. Yep. All right, so, um. And we really wanted to do a uh, birding day and we want to come back and do more because birds really lift the spirit. And during this time when a lot of things are shut down and healthcare workers are under so much stress taking care of the sick, um, we really want to lift everybody's spirit. And also, birding is the ultimate in social distancing, <laughs> the perfect thing to do. Um, we want to just give some tips today on our various tricks of the trade. Um, in the meantime, do support your first responders, your hospital workers, do PPE drives wherever you are. Um, the United States just became the top uh, most cases known in the world and it's still accelerating dramatically so we really need to get on top of that. Also, uh, we had to shut down all of our programs. We have no income so if you want to donate, there's a link at the bottom of the text that you can donate by PayPal. Uh, to help us through this time and help keep our administrative ta staff employed until summer camp, camp season uh, starts. All right, so um, we just wanted to start with um, putting together all of our bird feeders, which we have not had up for two years because about three years ago there was a rat explosion in the region uh, and everybody was like, shut down your bird feeders, everybody, and so we did. And uh, it's bad for the house and all sorts of things. Oh, yeah, hummingbirds again. And... Um, but then the weasel population exploded because there's so much food for the weasels. And within about three months, all the rats were gone. They are amazing, efficient killers. So there's always that cycle that comes around on a lot of the animals. So we're going to put this up because everybody needs to have bird feeders around during this time to keep the spirits up, and it's a great thing to learn. Um, using a bird field guide, we recommend any of them are good. And they kind of follow the taxonometric classification of how birds are related. Here's Sibley's, here's Peterson's, of course Audubon was the original. Um, and Kim, you're a Peterson girl, right? This That's is my your... original Peterson. <laughs> yeah. Oh, love Peterson. And it's, they're interesting, you learn so much. And if you have kids at home, this is a great quick uh, lesson, is just go through the bird book and see how the birds are related. The first section of the bird book is ducks basically and wading birds. The next section are small families like raptors, owls, uh, the galliforms, those are chicken-like birds, you know, grouse and turkey and that kind of thing. Woodpeckers, uh, other small families in the second toward the middle of the book, and hummingbirds. And, um, and then the whole second half of the bird book are basically one giant family of birds, the songbirds, the perching birds. And those include um, things you wouldn't normally think of sometimes, like the corvids, which are jays, crows, um, and uh, ravens, things like that. Um, we also just found on the lawn right here a bird that had run into the window and died. Um, came across it this afternoon. And so we're going to use it for our bird identification. Won't tell you what it is yet, but Kim's going to show you how to kind of identify a bird both in the field, kind of what you look for um, to try to quickly identify, and then some specifics on this bird to figure out what it Do is. Do you want me to hold it up? Sure. Okay. It's sad. Um, now, I will say that it is a considered an invasive gonna... bird um, that take over some native bird habitats, but Kim loves them so much, doesn't like me mentioning that. You know, 
Okay, here she's going to bring it up to the camera. Cool. They do not know that they are invasive. So this is the bird that um, struck the window. Yeah, there you go. Struck the window. There we go. I guess we got it on both. So you can see, so when you're trying to identify birds out in the field, everybody will have their different method, but the thing that I like to do um, is to do a quick beak to tail. So if you start out looking at the beak, you can see that this little critter has a very long beak for a songbird, um, and it's bright, bright yellow. So one of the things you can look at is the beak to head ratio. How many beaks would it take to go across the head, and it's about a one-to-one -one on this particular bird. That can help you tell the hump or the um, woodpeckers apart, the downy and the hairy woodpeckers. So bright yellow beak. Um, you notice that the head, but the, the body is kind of a uniform color, um, uniform dark color, but the feathers have a beautiful teal and purple iridescence. And then at the tips of a lot of the different feathers, um, it's really, really beige or light. So they almost look kind of speckly. You can see that the feet are a nice pink color. Um, and then when you look at, as you're going down the bird, so um, start with the beak, going down, You'll notice that the wings are a little bit shorter than the tail. Some birds, the wings extend past the tail. And then when you actually, um, let's see here, what else can we look at? Feet. Yeah, color. we kind of looked at the feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I looked at the color. So um, uh, some, birds, the some birds will have a notched tail. Some birds will have a straight tail. Some birds will have a white rump or a white vent area. Um, a lot of different things you can notice. When they're up um, in the trees, you can see their breasts. So definitely can stuff. see their breasts. Um, and then um, as you're doing your beak to tail, look for any sorts of stripes or coloration, spotting. Some birds will have a mustache. Some will have a streak across the but back of their head. Eye color? Um, they'll have an eyebrow. Um, they can have an eye ring, so it can go all the way around, like it form a complete bezel, or it could be a split ring, like white on top and on the bottom. So your American Robin has kind of a split bezel look for its eyes. So those are just some of the things that you can look at. The other things you want to notice are, what size is this bird? Is it about a robin size? Is it as big as a duck? Is it super, super tiny like a hummingbird? Um, is it um, perched? Is it on the ground? Where is it located? Oh, too bad. Yeah, might as well give up on the hummingbirds. <laughs> like so anyway, um, like Chris said, this is considered an invasive species, so it's not protected by the uh, Migratory Bird Act. And so I'm probably actually going to harvest a wing or something to show to the campers yeah. so we have a little beautiful sample. Beautiful color on this bird. Yeah, it is beautiful. So Very sad. Now, I love them. Yeah, so you look at all those things to try to identify and then you think, oh, is it a songbird? Is it, would it be one of the small family birds in the middle of the book? Would it be the beginning? The ducks and the wading birds? In this case, of course, is a song or perching bird. And so it's going to be in the second half of the bird book. And this one's pretty distinct. Um, of course, if I didn't know this bird, I'd be like, oh, this is a small crow or something. And so I'd look in that area and I wouldn't find it or a jay of some sort. So I just have to keep going because it's only, it's really kind of its own little family or subfamily. And so it is right here. And I love um, this new edition of uh, Peterson's because at the bottom it has these genus genuses in color and so you can kind of keep track of the different kinds of birds by the bottom anyway there's it is on page 300 there we go European starling. Yep. yep. In the Sternidae family. Yep. All right. So what, I have one more suggestion for you. If you really want to get to know your birds, what I did um, was every night before I went to bed, yes I really did this every night because I am a bird nerd. This might be backwards for you. Every night before I went to bed I would get out my bird book and I would just flip through and look at the pictures over and over and over again. They're so beautiful so why not? It's like nature's artwork. And then when I would see a bird out in the field I would go, oh I've totally seen that bird before and then I could go back to my book and find it. All right, so let's start with hummingbird feeders. Okay. Um, while Kim's going to show you how to do this to try to pre prevent, there's some dis avian diseases that you want to make sure that don't go around the bird populations and you, and you have to keep them, things clean and do it right so that you're not causing uh, you know, diseases within the bird community using the feeders. And so I'm gonna, Kim's gonna talk about that quite a bit. Right, so one of the diseases that you might see at your bird feeder, if you don't keep it clean, or if your neighbors don't keep their bird feeders clean, it's an avian pox. Actually, there's a couple different kinds of things that look like a pox. So house finches commonly get um, one of these, and I can't remember the scientific name, it's a mycoplasma something. Anyway, and it looks like they've got scabbing wounds around their eyes and on their face. It looks terrible. You will know instantly something's wrong. The other one, the avian pox, forms like these wart-like um, protuberances on the 
skin, the non-feathered areas, you're going to see it on their feet and on their beak and on their eyes. If you see that, you got to get out there and get all of your feeders down, take them down for a week so that the birds will disperse. Make sure you clean the heck out of them. And the cleaning solution that you probably want to use is going to be a distilled light vinegar and you mix it in a nine to one ratio with water. And so I keep it in a squirty bottle and in a little bottle like this. This one's great for cleaning out the bird bath. This one's great for squirting some of the bird feeders that I don't necessarily want to take down. So keep your birds safe by keeping your feeders and your bird baths and things clean. Okay, so next, hummingbird feeders. There are so many different kinds of hummingbird feeders. It makes it hard to pick sometimes, but I'm gonna make it really easy for you. And the way that you pick the very best hummingbird feeder is pick one that is easy to clean because some of those things have all sorts of beautiful flowers and, and decorations and everything on them, which is lovely to have, but they're super hard to clean, which means you won't do it. Or, well, you may, but I certainly don't do it. So I get this nice, inexpensive one. You can get it on Amazon, Fred Meyer. It's by Perky Pet. Um, and sometimes people say that they leak. So I usually just get a couple of them. They're like 3 or $4 each. Not a big deal. And I just keep them so that I can swap them out. So this is the feeder that I like to use. So we're going to make some hummingbird food right now so that I can show you how easy it is to make. All you do is you take some cane sugar, just use cane sugar, um, and some water. So because I don't like to wait, and I always want to feed my birds as soon as possible, I just heat up some water. The ratio is one to four. It's one quarter cup of sugar to one cup of water. Don't put your sugar in the container in some sort of a measuring cup to a quarter cup and then fill up to a cup or your ratio is going to be off. Do it separate. So you've got one cup of sugar to, or excuse me, one quarter cup of sugar to one cup of water. Super easy to do. So the way I do it, so I'm always running around last minute. Any of you know, any of you who know me. So I dump my quarter of a cup into a jar. I take some boiling hot water and I do a half of a cup of the boiling hot water. And I start out, the reason I start out with the boiling hot water is so that I make sure that the sugar dissolves in that really, really fast. And once I know that the sugar has dissolved, I will put in the other half of the cup of cold water because I want it to cool down really fast and then I'll throw it in the refrigerator. Always test it before you put it out in your bird feeder because you don't want to burn their little tongue. So you can see when you use the hot water, it dissolves super fast. So then you can throw in the, the uh, cold water. Bird is waiting for you. <laughs> it keeps coming over to the hanger. I know. Hanger. So there's my quarter of a cup of cold water. Put that in. It's still going to be too hot for me to put out right now for the birds. So I'm just going to leave it over here on the side and I'm going to hang back up this hummingbird feeder that I took down and I'm making him really, really mad. But one more thing I want to show you about hummer feeders. Those little teeny black ants that drive you crazy in the house, the way that you protect your hummingbird feeder from those is you get something that's called an ant moat. So what you do, there's a bunch of different ones. Here's a little, little cheap plastic one. What you do is you put a little bit of water in it, just like a little ant swimming pool. So they can climb up and then down into your feeder, but they can't actually, or um, climb down into where your feeder's located. And then they get trapped by the water so they can't actually get into your bird feeder. Of course, those are usually little sugar ants. Yes, little sugar ants. And they would love So this is what water. your system looks like, and I am going to go hang it on the feeder. Okay. Right now. While you're going to hang that on the feeder, I'm going to bring the cameras over to a couple of plants that we installed for the hummingbirds. And the rule of thumb for installing plants, any native shrub, especially berry plants that you install, uh, brings in another species. This is a red flowering currant, and the currants are edible. I would recommend edible berries, edible native berries. This right here is, it's already there, uh, this is salmon berry. And salmon berries, uh, the hummingbirds were all over this today as well. Do you want to Can mention? Can you see it? Oh. No, I just wanted to make sure okay. that it was in both of the cameras. Yeah. There it is. All right. Any one? of the blackberries would be wonderful to install. Of course, you maybe put them, if you don't want them creeping all over the place, you want to put them in pots. Yep, that's a red flaring that current. That's the best view. Yeah, that's red flaring currents. All right, let's go see if the hummingbird. Been back there. Oh, well, we'll watch. All right, so we're going to move on to other feeders that okay. you might want to have. Now, advisements are they can attract rats, and your squirrels are always a problem. But, but here, there's some mitigating factors. Yes. Yeah, so this right here, this can, you can see 
it. I got this at Tractor Supply, and it's great because the handle locks the lid in place. You can store all of your seeds and things in here so your rats can't chew through and get them because rats can definitely chew through plastic, so you got to watch out for plastic garbage cans, but these metal ones are wonderful. So I have a couple of different bird feeders here. Um, and these are both from Wild Birds Unlimited, and they were gifts. And so if you ever want to gift someone something that's just amazing and wonderful, bird feeders are great. So this one here comes almost completely apart, so it's really easy to clean, which once again is super important, is making sure you have an easy to clean bird feeder. So let's put that together. You can see the bigger holes. Um, these are for the, the standard seed mixes, like the things with the black oil, sunflower seeds, and the millet, things like that. What I have is black oil sunflower seeds, so that's what I'm going to load up in mine. Uh, while you might notice that the birds will make all of these uh, seeds fall down to the ground, they'll miss a lot, but that brings in uh, a bunch of other birds. By the way, the birds, birds. Yeah, the birds you want to attract with these are birds that are not eating birds with those big beaks a lot of times, um, and they will uh, come down out of the trees, you normally wouldn't see them, like gross beaks will come down. Uh, the um, woodpeckers will come, well that would be more to the suets. Um, the chickadees, of course, and of course if you're in the Midwest, we don't really have cardinals out here on the West Coast, uh, Northwest, but um, all the rest of the country will pull in all the cardinals. What else do you got? Okay, so I have this other feeder, it looks really, really similar, same thing, it has a removable bottom on it. And this has some tiny little holes, and this one is actually used for thistle seed, also called Niger. And I've got some of that. It's right here. It's a super tiny seed. So this is the seed that's going to attract things like um, your finches. So this is where you'll get the gold finches that come into your yard. And of course, gold finches are super, and they're absolutely stunning. The way that you can tell you about have, you have your gold finches in the spring during the breeding season, they're yellow, bright yellow. Um, but in the off season, the way you can tell is they will turn um, a more dull color, but they will always have the black and white wing bars. And so that's how you can really see The other out. thing that these two feeders will pull down are your warblers, which are really hard to identify in the field because they're small. And yellow they're rump up, warblers. Yeah, yellow rump warbler. And, uh, but they come down a little bit, so it's a great way to identify them. Um, you might, and then uh, down on the ground, it also pulls out a lot of birds that uh, are the ground feeding birds that live under the shrubs and things, and they'll come and feed underneath the uh, like feeders. Your toeys, your spotted wrens. toeys, your song sparrows. Oh, yeah, sparrows and wrens. And the um, golden crown sparrows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really beautiful. And of course, you have to clean it up if you're starting to attract rats. And yeah, stuff like and that. you can buy mixes that are already hulled, like the no mess seeds that are just the the um, meats of the seeds. So these are the two feeders. I'm gonna hang those up, and those are wonderful. And then there's one more thing that I like to to use that um, the birds really really like. And if you like bush tits, I will tell you they're one of my favorite birds. They're super small. Um, and now around use. the country, have different kinds of tits. We have bush. They tits. do. We have bush tits, and people have and woodpeckers. Yeah. Love oh, yes, the woodpeckers. Oh, my gosh. Actually, the chickadees go crazy. The nuthatches, they all love this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of different brands of suet. I happen to have out a nut and insect blend over in our dogwood tree. And then I'm going to put this high-energy year-round suet. Um, some people say that you can make it yourself, but be really diligent um, reading the recipes because some things can be harmful for birds. And you want to make sure not to, get, not to set up anything where it can get the fats on in their feathers because then they lose their... Um, their ability to stay warm because their feathers are... Kimmer, why don't you set those up? We'll watch you set them up. I'm going to mention a couple other things that are really wonderful about having bird feeders. Um, and one way. of them, and you have to watch, warn your children about this, is that the exceptors, the uh, little <laughs> hawk-like birds, love coming in, like sharp shin hawks, Cooper's hawks, maybe sometimes merlins or other small falcons, depending on what area of the country you're in. And... You might notice that they're right by our windows <laughs> because, uh, oh yeah, Kimmer, do you want to talk about how to keep uh, birds from striking your windows? I can, sure. Let me get the Because, of course, they see the reflection and sometimes go after it. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of um, information out there about preventing window strikes, which are incredibly sad when the bird thunks your window and then falls to the ground. And if it does that, you can go out. If it's still alive, you can put it in a little box and see if it wakes up or maybe it needs to go to a rehabber. But oftentimes they don't survive. Well, sometimes they don't survive. So some of the things that people do is to prevent the, the windows from looking like a mirror where they see an opposing bird flying at them and they might want to fight it or who knows. Um, 
you can put up the little window decals, but unfortunately they found that you have to put them up so close together that your windows are almost always covered with all these decals. But there's a new way to do it that's kind of coming out where you take um, some sort of a paracord or a rope and you put something across it, like a some sort of a beam across the top, and then you hang the cord um, down at a certain distance apart. I don't have to Google what that yeah, is. Yeah, we have those on our bigger windows, but uh, now that the Starling um, probably hit this window, we're going to have to do them on and you all can our windows. See them. So Especially since we're going to be pulling. So it's a little bit of a distraction when you're birding, but it's going to save the bird's life, and you get used to it, yeah. so it's not really that big of a deal. So Our, I'm going to go paying the feeder over here okay. on the other one. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and the hummingbird's going to be coming. It's sitting right there in the dogwood. Oh, we just scared it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of trying to see birds when, um, you know, say you're trying to get a good picture, I'm going to show you a little trick. And uh, to do this, I'll... I'll Maybe well, focus you out. Wait up for the hummingbird yeah, to come back? sure. Well, I guess we'll just do it right focus here this this it. way. Yeah, and then I'm going to yeah, talk about try. how to um, how to use your binoculars. Kimmer, what kind of binoculars do you have? Um, I have some Nikon's. Yeah. I have Nikon the also. They're sm I like smaller. <laughs> There's an icon too. Yeah, if you want some really good binoculars, if you don't have a ton of money, I mean, you can spend thousands of dollars on binoculars. But um, Nikon is really wonderful. These are the Monarchs, and I absolutely love them uh, for birding, and they're waterproof. But the thing that's really good about it too is if you damage your binoculars and you send them to Nikon, they will fix them and send them back to you uh, for free. And in fact, we even had some. <laughs> I know. We even had some. Uh, I have to tell them, We even okay. had some binoculars that we. I, I wrote to them and I said I dropped these out of the car, and they sent me. They were going to send me a brand new pair, but it was a discontinued kind, and so they sent me the newest model of it. I mean, they are awesome. So anyway, these are mine, and if you want to wear them comfortably, you can get a binocular bra. Um, so our friends Just Clay like and this. Reagan taught us a really cool trick where you don't need a big scope and a telephoto lens. Um, notice that. This is how you normally uh, use your binoculars. They kind of screw out if you don't have glasses. If you do have glasses, you screw them in, and that's how you use them while you're wearing your glasses. Um, but screw them out, and then, Kimmer, do you want to use yours? Put it up to one camera, and I'll put it up to the other. Oh, dear. Um, and we're going to see if we can basically just your bring can your... Can I do mine, and you can do yeah, yours? Right. Bring your, cam your binoculars really close up to... And you have to move it around... Until you find well, I normally exactly. Do it the other direction, but... Yeah, well, that's true. We usually are doing it backwards, oh. and it's great to have a friend that's helping. <laughs> uh, All right, this could be. This really is not going to be in focus, of course, because it's. Oh, ah, yeah. There we go. Okay. So of course you have to focus everything. Well, but you get the idea. We get some really good photos yeah. of the big, huge, wonderful, you know, hawks and things like that that are perching. Just put it right up next to your uh, phone and uh, move it around until it's just perfect and click, take your pictures and you can really get um, some good photos. Speaking of which, we should, uh, is there anything at the snag? I don't know, but I, well, I don't really need to That's show okay. the, Yeah, yeah the, um, one of the wonderful things you can try to get into your yard is the best place to bring in all the wildlife is snags. Don't cut down all your dead trees and branches, only if they're a hazard. Matter of fact, you, Next door in the wetlands, uh, they installed a s installed snags because it's the <laughs> place where all the insects come and then all the birds come and then, of course, the raptors perch on the top. And that's a wonderful thing to always have is dead trees that aren't going to fall Also over called a wildlife them. tree. Wildlife tree. Much more attractive name. Yeah, so let's... Can I add one more thing? Yeah, and then we're going to head out and try birds. to find some wetlands. Now, to find wetland birds like red-winged blackbirds, marsh wrens, things like that, you have to go to the wetlands. These are things that you can use to clean your bird feeders and make sure that if you get these for your bird feeders, don't mix them up with any other feeders that you have. We have some mice and the rabbit, um, the chickens and the dog. Don't clean other animals, uh, dishes and things with your wild bird um, cleaners. Yeah, so now in the future we're going to do a broadcast on language of the birds and that's how you find animals that chickadees are calling. Um, you find animals and you can find out which, what is a call, what's a song. Like for instance, the chickadee, of course, people think of chickadee dee dee, but their song is actually more like. Can you actually hear? There's one in the background. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's head over this direction and see if we can um, let the birds come in here and then go f over to our installed wetlands, which has cattails. And we're hoping that a red winged blackbird will move in because they only live in cattails. And of course, there's marsh wrens and the tall grass. Uh, in the wetlands as well. Let's go check it out. 
All right, let's go this way. And also, I put the ca the uh, the guitar and the drum because we're gonna have a special guest drummer. <laughs> um, I'm gonna bring those along with us. You can of course put yours on as a backpack. All right, let's go this way and look for some birds. Now we've got, uh, it's good to again have a diversity of trees. We've got uh, Sitka spruce, which is a native evergreen, one of them in this area. We've got big Lombardi poplar tree. Uh, and there's a bunch of things living in there. I just saw a bird going over here to the wetlands. Oh, do you hear that marsh wren? Doing a little alarm over in the top tall grass on the far side of the wetlands over there. But let's go over and check this out. Here's a little um, wetlands that we built with cattails. And, um, oh, by the way, I noticed when I was coming in here, another thing that brings uh, a lot of wetlands love, let's check this out here, Ooh, is some cool. nice tracks. Speaking of which, we're going to do some wildlife tracking, my favorite hobby in the world. Also awesome for social distancing, <laughs> animal tracking. We won't tell you what that is, but if anybody knows what those are, those tracks, please comment. All right, I don't see okay. any ducks or anything over there right now. And uh, so we'll save it for another time of bird adventure. Yes. Maybe we should just do our song to yes. finish up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm filming you, you're filming me. <laughs> All right, and hopefully, if we're lucky, we'll have to stop the song to see some birds. Um, let's turn it this way. Which way? Because otherwise we'll be in the middle. Oh. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, I'd like to bring the, uh, could you run and grab the, um, I'll set this up and you could run and grab my green, uh, So anybody is out there, I want to reiterate, um, to keep going outdoors. It's really the healthiest place to be. Uh, you uh, can really get some nice sun when it is, or even if it's not, there's enough vitamin D and UV rays out there that'll help to keep you happy, keep you healthy. And also, they found in the 1918 flu pandemic that people would get well quicker when they got outdoors. Of course, not cold, wet. Uh, that would not be good for the lungs. But they did find a higher rate of recovery. Um, and you can read that. And medium.com has a really great article about that. Okay. All right. Okay. So tomorrow we're going to probably switch over to doing an herbal salve and the following day some wild edible cooking and then next week um, we're going to go back to our gardening. We're going to out on the front by the sidewalk probably do a community sidewalk garden. Uh, try to get people to participate in that for increased food and financial security. Go out wildlife trafficking next week and who knows any suggestions that you have please let yeah, us know. Yeah, you want to learn something. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this song, apologies to all the Bob Marley lovers out there who, you know, he obviously does it right, but this is a song that <clears throat> is appropriate for right now. There's a lot to worry about, but sometimes you just have to let it go. Oh
broadcasting just to the Wolf Camp and Conservation College Facebook page and then posting it afterwards to the Wolf College website. I'm not sure I can always do it to my personal Facebook page. We will post it there afterwards. So everybody be well and we'll see you tomorrow.